Recording is on. So, hey, welcome everyone to the first, uh, yeah, UX research call of 2022. Um, it is the 29th of June. And yeah, we have a great bunch of people here who are going to share their knowledge and yeah, just, you know, teach and learn from each other. Uh, my name's Mo. I'm from the Bitcoin design community. Um, do you guys just want to maybe go around the room and introduce yourselves? Sounds good. Uh, my name's Jalissa. I, I'm recently like started working in the Bitcoin scene. I've been with Amber, the Amber app, uh, Bitcoin only app for the last seven months. But I've had I've had an interest for quite a while, so I made the jump and haven't looked back. It's been a great experience. And it's been awesome also learning from the Bitcoin design community here. Cool. You're you're pretty active as well. You know, you ask questions and stuff. That's really <laughs> cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a good resource for sure. Can't hear you. Yeah, we can't hear you, Jonathan. I'm not quite sure. It's, it's yeah. Someone else want to maybe go in the meantime? Uh... So my name is Jakub. Um, I'm just starting to contribute to Bitcoin design. So I'm really glad that I uh, I'm a witness of the first UX research <laughs> poll. Cool. Yeah, welcome. Yeah, I guess I'll go. I'm, I'm, uh, my name is Rick, and I've just been lurking in the uh, design community Slack channel here for about a year. And uh, I was telling Mo that this was one that actually popped up on a time that I could join at 2.30 in the afternoon for me. So. Uh, but I do UX, UX design for my professional career, and I just have an interest in Bitcoin. So uh, I thought it would be fun to join and, and hear what you all have to say. Yeah. Cool. Welcome. Are you working now? Oh, is your volume working now, I'm Jonathan? Or uh, are we good now? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good. Um, yeah, nice to be with you all. My name is Jonathan. I work as a senior UX designer for the Home Depot. Um, very passionate about Bitcoin, really love, like you said, Rick, lurking around the Slack channel and seeing you know, all the great work that's happening. Um, and yeah, yeah, excited to talk about, you know, research methods today. Yeah, I'm really keen on, on, on you know, hearing. So we're going to basically, um, today we're basically going to be focusing on user personas as a way to guide the, the UX design process. And Jalissa is going to share with us um, how they do that at Amber. She's very kindly volunteered to do that, just, you know, share something practical. And Jonathan was going to also share with us, um, correct me if I say it wrong, maybe some other methods that he basically also uses to understand users on a deeper level. That's not necessarily user personas. Um, so really curious to hear from the two of them. Um, I did prepare a little bit of something on Fig Jam just to, um, I'm going to just, just to do a really brief introduction. I am going to share the link because I'm a visual person. So, you know, like to keep things nice and visual. It's a document that we can all pretty much, um, edit. It's completely editable. I will share my screen. Can everyone see my screen? Uh, you can see the chat and the, yeah, that looks like it. Yeah, is that good? Yeah. All right, cool. So I just had a bit of fun with this. Um, you know, I just was like, I thought user personas, it's just, reminding us during the product development process, you know, that we're developing for humans, you know, really remembering that there's people behind those, those apps and those um, desktop applications that we create. Um, and I guess every single um, user process uh, for creating personas is different. 
Um, but basically, the gist of it that I understood was we basically will gather data using qualitative research techniques. And that is basically, you know, talking to a bunch of people, doing some interviews, you know, the fun, interesting part, really connecting with the users. Um, what do we get out of that? We get this fictional profile, which is actually based on real data which basically represents a group of users with the same interests, goals, and characteristics. And then, you know, we have this little, this woman here sitting and, you know, that's the individual user profile that we've created. And why do we actually do it? Um, I guess, you know, we want to build more empathy for our users in the, um, in the product development process. Um, and these personas are only really useful if they're actually based on real data that's actually taken from actual research and not based on assumptions. And then a very broad general example I gave is, you know, a basic profile would be give their role, their situation, their age, any user needs or goals that they have, and their current solutions and frustrations. And then this is the part where um, Jonathan comes in, what other research methods can we use to understand our users? So yeah, that's basically it, short and sweet. And now definitely ready to hear from Janissa and Jonathan um, and just, yeah. Yeah, looking forward to hearing from you guys. Uh, feel free, whoever wants to start. I'm happy to dive in. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so I guess, where will I start? Um, I think you made, I like I like your your layout here. I think definitely the most important part of this process for me, at least, is is having that regular cadence of talking with with our users. Um, and I think we're quite lucky at Amber that, for the fact that we actually invest a lot of time and resources into that process of getting to know our customers. Um, currently, since I've I've started, I've been able to kind of maintain this cadence of having two about two one or two user interviews per week so that's been really awesome to get to know to get to know the users part of that process i'll conduct the interview um it's always helpful to record and then i will add that to our dovetail tool i don't know if you guys have come across that but it's a brilliant tool that lets you upload upload your interviews and uh and go go ahead and then tag tag um, pieces of important information throughout that interview that came up um, it's very hard to to remember what's what's come up in that interview um, so yeah definitely definitely helpful to record go back to tag and and then reflect on on the data um, alongside of the user interviews you're also looking um, we also have we also rely heavily on on intercom um, and I'm still trying to use that to its uh, best advantage. So that's like an in-app tool, uh, if you're not aware, um, that allows us pretty much direct communication with, with users. Uh, there's a few ways that I've been exploring how to use that. Um, I can, I've got some things here I might dump into, into the Puma file. Um, yeah, so a little bit of, of a look at like the intercom and the dovetail, like you can see in this in the image there that um, it's very, uh, you can tag, go ahead and tag and start bringing that picture together, start building, seeing patterns, I guess that's really what it comes down to. You start seeing these patterns um, across different user groups that you, you're talking to. Uh, that helps to form, to, that helps to form, I guess, the personas that you're, you're leaning into. Uh, yeah, um, Intercom is a really interesting one. Uh, that, I, what I really uh, am liking about that is the opportunity to get faster feedback um, from from users and start conversations as quickly as possible to help you know get down to the whys that help get you that broad understanding of of the context that surrounds users I guess um, so that's me uh, my one of my roles is, as a product designer at amber is definitely collecting the customer research and I think when it comes to personas when it comes to the personas, that's really a tool to help share that information across 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 your team, right? Um, 
not everyone has the time to, to, to collect that data to do those interviews. So I guess what a, what a persona profile gives you um, is, is a template uh, or the information that's been collected that can be then shared across the team. Um, yeah, and I guess with that, you also want to be, you also want to keep, you know, keep questioning your assumptions or, or you know, the data that you've collected and, and how you're how you're grouping these different user types. You're always wanting to question um, question how that comes to, comes about. I do have another screenshot that I wanted to share. Uh, so um, actually, I'll start back on on this strategizer template. We found I found this one quite helpful. Um, so with this one, this is just an example of how you could put together, I guess, uh, or collect collect some information around around your persona. So this one is really helpful for myself as a product. Uh, as a, like being in a product role because it it is more contextual, I guess, to to my product design needs. And um, whereas a typical persona that kind of highlights bios and stuff, I don't get as much information from that. And it may it may be more important to the marketing team to have that bit more of a context. But for me, I, I I'm more interested, I guess, in the intrinsic and extrinsic motivators of, of the users that I've been talking to. Uh, so this strategizer template, it's been quite helpful to that. Um, so as I'm having these conversations, I guess what, I, what I'll do is I'll collect a massive data or key points. So what are the gains? What are the, what are the things that I like? And this I'll be able to do in Dovetail. I can create categories. Uh, I can see what our customers are liking, where, where the friction points are, what are they having issues with? And then also try and understand those those jobs to be done, uh, which is a section here. Um, jobs to be done. Yeah, and then it, and then from there, I guess you have you you start to see the different patterns. You could start to see, say, several different um, persona or or yeah personas that appear um, for Amber. For Amber, on a broader scale, you've got the the, the newer Bitcoiners, um, and then on the other scale, scale of that, you've got the like the longer term Bitcoiners, and they're def they they definitely have different different pains, gains, and and the jobs to be done, uh, like jobs that they're, that they're looking like looking to be solved, right? Um, with this, I've also kind of. I think it's good to make it flexible to to your own needs. So I also like to consider the different the different quotes um, unique to that kind of group. Uh, this Jordan identity, um, I guess, what I've gathered from that, they're the longer term Bitcoiners. So some some of the things that some of the patterns I guess that that appear in that group user group is that uh, you know they're kind of disillusioned by by the government. So you will see a lot of comments about about government and maybe they, they're relying on alternative news sources and whatnot, uh, but yeah. But what this gives me is just kind of a tool to kind of reflect back on um, or, or use persona details to directly impact how I prioritize uh, product um, or product or projects and whatnot. Oh, what else did I have to share? Um, but yeah, that's mostly it. I've, I've dropped those templates in there. Um, they may be helpful. Wow, thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, that is brilliant. Do you have anything else to add or it's really nice? Thank you so much, wow. There's another template that I, I'll share um, and that, that also helps us communicate product with the marketing team based on our personas and it's probably a more typical persona profile that you you come across yeah but yeah that definitely helps uh impact i guess the copy and the way you're communicating the way you're communicating with users yeah i don't know um happy to answer any questions but otherwise i think yeah this is it's definitely been uh, it's definitely more of an art form I'd say than than a true science for me at the moment. I'm always just trying to I guess uh, 
make sure that the data that I'm collecting is really helping to inform like different products to uh, or different projects to prioritize, I guess. The other thing I'll also comment on, which I think is important, is um, making sure that your user personas that you're identifying, like I guess there's a way to value them. Again, it's like your business, the brand needs and the brand and the and the business goals, I guess. So, I mean, I guess a lot of Bitcoin Bitcoin only apps will come across like the trader types that are that will probably prompt you to or encourage you to add other other um, other coins and whatnot. But I guess if that just as an example, if that doesn't align to your to your brand, that's not something something you're going to prioritize, I guess. For sure. That's where the Venn diagrams help, I think. Yeah, this is great stuff. Yeah, I, I like how this uh, dovetail, you can have all your insights in one spot and then you can uh, do a search based on a certain term and then just have it right in front of you. Um, I, one of the questions I had was, um, if maybe you could talk a little bit about kind of the catalyst for doing this type of research. Is it usually that there's like a feature you want to test on or is it, uh, have you been asked to just get mm -hmm. insights from the customer base? Um, whenever I've like conducted the user research, there's always like specific answers that I'm trying to get product related. Uh, but in general, I think it's good practice to keep those conversations going continuously and continuously, you know, asking those questions like why the more, I guess, higher level questions, why are you interested in Bitcoin? I guess it keeps you on the pulse of your customers, I guess, weird, weird way to say it, but um, I guess you, you stay frequent with your customers, with your users, you know kind of what they're listening to, the, the different resources that they're leaning into, um, maybe community groups that they're a part of, uh, and all of that information, I think it comes together and helps, definitely helps you have that this full context that's surra that's surrounding your user groups um, to help to help guide product for sure. Yeah, thanks. Hmm. So Julissa, would you typically um so this is how you collect information. So typically you would have these four, these are these green boxes here. You would go mm -hmm. to you know, you have all these different sources of your data. So that would be dovetail, then intercom responses, community events, and then maze. Okay, so those are your four sources of data. And then you are, so that's kind of like all the different data sources. And then you're basically, cool. So those are screenshots from intercom, I'm guessing. Yeah, that's right. And then this is in dovetail. So these are the actual user interviews. Okay, all right. Mm. Yeah, that's nice. nice. I like how you added in. So you created an image of this user persona, like a, just a cartoon image of him. And you basically placed them over all of the interviews where you felt like this person is that kind of. Yeah. Uh, that's really yeah, so that's actually one thing that we do. We have we have our persona types. And as part of Dovetail, you're actually able to create a tag. Um, so I can tag. And then I can tag different conversations based on kind of the persona that they're, they seem to be falling into. Yeah. And then I guess you can come back and, and search based on that tag. So like this, sorry, what were you saying? Yeah, exactly what you said. Um, Dovetail allows you to, to create these, uh, create categories, I guess. Um, yeah. So with those categories I've created, we've got the four different user types that Amber's kind of identified and We'll have those conversations and then based on that conversation i can kind of see where they fit um, nice. whether they're one of like more whether they're more motivated to save more motivated to trade they're a longer term bitcoiner or or yes yeah, sorry, others you refer to then you basically move over to the value proposition canvas so that would be your kind of step number two and then you would be kind of building out this it's not really a persona it's a type of persona kind of but it's more the intrinsic motivation of that user. 
Um, yeah, I, not so much that, but uh, I guess what this helps me to do is, uh, with this is actually, yeah. So I guess for this one, sorry, I'll have, I'll have my different personas. Um, I could have several of these. And what I'll do is I'll collect, I'll have a bunch of data so I could have a bunch of these stickies um, and I've just collected the data. And then what I'll go about doing is kind of organizing that data in the different groups. So this could be number two, um, persona two. Then I'll go about organizing that data. Um, they could cover multiple personas. Um, so uh, this secondary second, second persona may appreciate the same um, thing in app. They may appreciate that they have a Bitcoin only app that they can refer. Uh, whereas they also may be kind of secondary things that the user appreciates, but it's not as strongly. Whereas for the second persona, they may appreciate that that more. So I'll highlight that green. Um, this could be a secondary motivator, I guess. Nothing that they appreciate in app. Um, and that's that's kind of how I I um, pull all the, uh, I guess, organize all the data in these different uh, personas. Again, like you could have, you could have something uh, that a user appreciates, whereas another user, it might be a pain for them, just as an example. Um, they may, like uh, a, uh, someone newer to Bitcoin may find friction in trying to use our fee toggle. Um, and then I can connect that to a user code or something like that. Yeah, that's more of a, a practical kind of way of how I I can use this um, value proposition canvas. So it's almost like you've tweaked the traditional user persona setting to be more suitable for specific changes within the actual app itself. It's, and that uh, you kind of do it this way. Yeah, definitely. Um, I guess we do have personas at Amber, but I um, and I can give you a screenshot of kind of a draft that I have got here. But I find these I find these much less helpful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I guess um, I guess I could I could jump in here and um and edit these quite a bit. Or update these quite a bit, but I guess motivators. When I when I see lifestyle change and enlightenment, it doesn't give me much. I oh. guess a whole lot there to work with. Um, if it was more product specific, specific, I guess that's probably something we could look at doing is kind of making this relate a bit more to Amber and the product, the app. Yeah. But yeah, that's kind of where we're where we're at, and I'm definitely still still uh, learning and still trying to work out how to, I guess, best uh, collect and then and then formulate or understand understand all the all the data that we're collecting from users and um, yeah, I guess we use that to solve to solve unique user problems and hmm. but it's a good process. So after you finish after you have like let's say three of that Personas on this canvas. Do you fill the left side as well? Like, do you? Is, uh, as, as yeah. Can, it works like you in the, on the right side. You identify, you know, pains or, or gains, and then on the left side, mm -hmm. you kind of try to find solutions. Who either creates create gains, right? Yeah. Or like features in the app or that create these gains or. Uh, are features in the app or a redesign of the app or design of the new app that uh, answers the the reverse, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, so, so, uh, hmm. Yeah, sorry. No, I just wanted to ask uh, because I didn't get if you if you also like uh, feel that or you maybe try to because I guess it's different. Mm -hmm. Because I encountered value proposition canvas like uh, at the postgraduate studies, 
of UX and we did it like, you know, before there was like in the early stage of, let's say, product. So I wonder, because I guess you, when you, when you're, when you're doing that, it's, you're doing that with an app already uh, on a different stage of research and different, you know, basically different research, not like on the beginning of the product. And, and yeah, and so maybe my question is, so when you feel the left side, do you feel that sep separately also for each persona or perhaps you want to find a common, I don't know. Um, with that left side, it's, we've already, we've already filled that out. So we're already, we already understand how, we, we already understand like our pain relievers, games and game creators. And then, and then I guess what this kind of gives us for, as an example, um, with this particular persona, they have an asset that they're, well, they're actively looking for, um, they're actively looking for a leveraged product to buy more Bitcoin. So that may influence a, a game creator <laughs> that we may look into or, or one of those, or I guess that, yeah, that may, that may, um, that may help us decide like where, if there's a part that may fit in with what we've, uh, what we've put over on this left-hand side. Okay, thanks. Uh, and uh, uh, one more question, the dovetail, the transcript is automatic, right? It's, it reads the, from the recording. Pardon? The transcript, the quote, mm -hmm. the, text is uh the dovetail does it automatically right from the recordings yeah yeah, yeah. that's cool really nice Julissa. it's so interesting to see how you've kind of you know just almost yeah it's you it's a slight modification of the traditional user persona process because you know it's speaking to the users on a consistent basis. You say you speak to at least two users a week and then you're constantly updating this value proposition canvas, I guess. Um, and then how would you, what's the next step? So you kind of have these pains um, and these gains. So, you know, all these on the right side of the canvas, you have all of these little post-it notes and then how are you basically communicating that back to the product development team? How does that move back into the actual UI or, you know, product development process? I guess from, for, from here, I guess I work with, I work with a team at kind of identifying what, what we want to address, whether there's a pain or a game um, or I guess something that's come up in in our user conversations that is we, we see as an opportunity um, and that'll be an opportunity that that will impact the the business outcome that my team has been set with so we'll have a business outcome that we're working towards and then I guess this gives us uh, a broader view of the different personas um, and from that I guess we're also identifying what opportunities there are and in what persona that opportunity really who that really relates to um, I think that's really helpful uh, too when you're going through when you start actually designing designing something out um, because it will guide I guess it will guide the kind of feedback that you design into the screens, uh, it it will decide, I guess, how you communicate a particular feature or a product. Um, so yeah, that's basically it. We we use uh, like the your opportunity solution tree by Teresa Torres. Um, mm -hmm. Don't know if we can cross that, but that basically we we kind of look holistically over the user data that we've been we've collected put them all together in sticky notes and uh, we have the business outcome uh, at, at the top of that that tree so that's our main focus and then i guess it's about identifying the opportunity 
who does that relate to? Which persona type, which persona group um, is that kind of geared towards? Are they valuable? Are they like a key valuable group to use to to Amber, I guess? Um, and then it, I guess, yeah, we go about testing that, making sure, making sure um, that we understand that opportunity and that it's viable or that our customers definitely appreciate it. Um, yeah, a uh, bit of back and forth of testing. And then I guess ultimately something comes through, I guess, hopefully. And and then you go into the, you go further into the design process. And I guess I lean more into, I, I lean into these personas, um, especially, I guess, uh, the dovetail interviews that I've had to, I guess, better understand how the different copy that I'll include throughout the process. Um, I recently, we we introduced uh, on-chain sends, um, on-chain on Bitcoin sends. So I was considering uh, whether our whether our I guess persona types that who are more new to Bitcoin who don't quite understand or on-chain is like a foreign word to them. How do we communicate that to them? But then how do we also uh, tailor it to to I guess our high uh, our longer term Bitcoiners also users that have stuck with us for or been with us for a long time. They have a better understanding of Bitcoin and they they want faster sends, you know. But then also consider that this user type um, may may um, may not be as concerned about or may not have as many fears about the the view of Bitcoiners around, I guess, Bitcoin security and you know making that send their first time send to to a another wallet um, that can be that was something that I guess I realized was um, uh, I guess an anxious uh, it caused a lot of anxiety for these newer Bitcoiners to jump into the app and then and then send Bitcoin for the first time so how could I make that as uh, like you know um, an easier process for them was there something an educational that we could provide so something that we did there was uh, was we actually created like a bit of a for the first time send we had you could go through I guess a bit of an educational on how to make that send um, and we use language for like your first time Bitcoin is that um, language that they could understand um, yeah so I guess that's kind of how it comes into the development phase and I guess also user stories come come into that as well um, Brilliant, really brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing. Does anyone have any questions for, for Jalissa or shall we move on to Jonathan, which is going to, he's going to be educating us on, you know, other methods that he uses as a senior UX designer to, uh, yeah, get closer to users. No, nope. all right. Uh, Jonathan, feel free to thank you very much, Jalissa. So, yeah, if anyone has any questions, anything comes up for Jalissa, feel free to ask her. But, um, oh, Rick would like to speak. Okay. No, I was uh, just trying to give a thumbs up and it was a raise my hand and said, sorry. <laughs> All right. Cool. Okay. Jonathan, please share, you know, share, you know, any methods that you've used. We're all ears. All right. Um, firstly, I'd like to say that I feel woefully unprepared. <laughs> I feel like, Jalissa, you, you hit it out of the park. You brought all your screenshots and everything. I, I was really just kind of aiming to talk about some alternative methods, some, some of which you mentioned, like jobs to be done. But while we were talking, I did manage to just Google some pictures just for reference so that we can know what I'm actually referring to. So having said that, <clears throat> I'll go ahead and put some of the reference material over here. Um, I just wanted to begin by saying that, like I am by no means like against personas, their usage or, you know, like how they bring value. Um, the perspective that I'm gonna share is just in the companies that I've worked for, our, our timelines and our, you know, just really our UX kind of procedures have dictated that I, I haven't used them much and instead have used some other things. Um, one of them that you mentioned, Jalissa, was uh, jobs to be done. So just a quick reference for that. 
here's kind of a diagram of some of the thinking about jobs to be done, how it is divided. Um, the main kind of consideration here is viewing um, the software product through the lens of almost like a worker. Like the software product is a worker and it has a job that needs to be done. Or, excuse me, the, the user needs a job to be done um, by the software. So that's the thinking with jobs to be done. It usually follows a particular format, which I've pasted here. Um, so an example would be, keep my feet warm in the winter when I work outside. So there's um, the action that the software is doing, what it's acting on, and also a context, which it's sometimes referred to as a clarifier. Um, these can sometimes have like an emotional dimension to them, as you can see in this graphic here. So there is potential for understanding the user um, on an emotional level and, and to empathize with the user. Um, the main thing here though, is that it's very um, direct. It's, its object is to try to get down to um, the core functionality that the piece of software needs to be able to perform in order to actually serve the user in their need. So the central question being, you know, how do we understand and how do we document user needs? You know, definitely a persona can be used for that, but jobs to be done, um, in my experience, has, is also a very efficient way of doing that. It's also um, pretty flexible. Like if there is a business need, let's say, um, you know, it can be expanded to also describe the business needs that are required for a particular piece of software from um, the perspective of the business. Um, and I also have just an article here in case anyone wanted to do further digging on this. Um, jobs to be done, how they relate to personas. Like I said before, um, you know, I think it's, it's pretty clear that they're not like a replacement for personas. Um, there is that dimension of building empathy that is lacking in this exercise, but it is something that also um, gets at the idea of what are the user's needs. Um, any questions on that before I, I moved on to the next artifact? I do have a question. I find this um, really interesting. Um, so basically, the jobs to be done is another way of getting data to decide what job the jobs the software needs to do. So, okay. And then you have main job to be done, related jobs to be done. So how are you collecting this information? How do you collect this data? Sure. So on the front end of the research process, you know, what I've seen um, in various organizations is very similar to what Jalissa described in the beginning up front over here about having interviews. And I definitely second that statement of, you know, the more regular, the more frequent your exposure to the user group is, the better. Um, most of my experience is in enterprise UX. So most of the research that I've done isn't really interfacing with consumers. It's more like internally facing employees who are using you know, software in the case of like the Home Depot um, in the store or in the corporate office. So we tend to have a very close relationship with our user group. And, you know, since they're Home Depot employees, we can reach out to them, we can IM them. Um, and it's very easy to set up regular meetings and interviews. So the, the front end processes, I would say, look very similar. As far as the tooling, it, it was cool to see a lot of these tools. Um, currently, we use a, a tool called Enjoy HQ. I can write that down over here. But this is another uh, software tool used to kind of collaborate and also collect data um, that has been gathered in the research process. So, so that's the front end I would say is very similar to the process that Jalissa described. And then here with jobs to be done, it's more a question of how do we condense the information and how do we um, share it out and document it in an artifact that is, um, you know, understandable and, you know, it, it's a, an efficient way to communicate those research insights. Mm. Very nice. Thank you. Sure. Um, the next 
method and kind of dovetailing off of that same point of, you know, collecting the research insights, collaborating on them, and then sharing them out is really just um, like a, a slide deck. Um, and in various places, these are called different things. So, um, like, they might be called a readout or, you know, just a, like, a, an explanation of what was found out during the, the actual research process. I don't have any screenshots from from some that I um, worked on, but just, just for the sake of having a visual, you know, just um, a deck that has, you know, quantitative and qualitative data about what we collected. Depending on the scope of the project, you know, these are a lot of times more warranted if the research project is, you know, very large in scope, if it's like a new whole app or a new piece of software that's being developed, you know, it will oftentimes warrant a more thorough research process and then readout or presentation when it comes to communicating and documenting the findings. Um, so I would say that is another thing. Just a side note that kind of occurred to me just now is that working in Enterprise UX, it's often a case that for user groups are very small. So that's another reason why that we've perhaps strayed away from personas. So, you know, if if the user group is, you know, five or six people, we tend to know their names, know those pieces of demographic information. And I think in those scenarios, it makes less sense to make a, a persona where those things are, you know, they're already known from the real people themselves. Um, but on to the last um, kind of artifact that I was going to mention. And I think this, this ought to be really familiar, but just, um, the user story. So here's an example of the template for a user story. It's usually communicated in this fashion of as a particular type of user, and that might be seen as a proxy for different kinds of personas. So like a new user or a pro user, um, I want, and then a statement of the functionality or the need, and then so that, so that uh, the value or the benefit can be described as to you know, what that piece of software is actually doing to address the need. Um, so again, in places that I've worked, this is really, I think, it, when it comes to the question of what is most referenced and amongst different members of the interdisciplinary team of product and development, what is actually used to understand user needs is usually, you know, that's, it's most referenced in the user story. And, you know, it, it flows into the acceptance criteria for when it's actually developed and, you know, in, in different places I've worked, I've had differing amounts of impact on the user story. And obviously it depends on the kind of story, whether it's a kind of front end story or, or a different kind. But um, yes, this is definitely a place where ultimately that, that most succinct version of the user need will feature and actually be uh, shared across the team. Yeah, and um, that that's pretty much all I wanted to share. I do have one other article um, for further reading on user stories. Um, but yeah, that's that's pretty much uh, the major areas I wanted to cover. Are there any questions about any of this? I have a question. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about how you landed on these as the tools that you use. I mean, it seems like as UX professionals, we're trying to find that fit of the tool that kind of, uh, as you're saying, you know, you, you have a certain use case for the, the people that you work with and the size of the groups. Um, did you like try to use personas before or other things that just didn't work very well? I and mean, then you finally decided that this is what worked best? Yeah, I, I mean, I would say ultimately it's like an organization decision. And like in, in one of the companies that I've worked for, it was a very small UX group and, you know, we we're very close with the manager and, and we could have more influence over the direction. And in that company, we did make a persona once. And what I would say is that from our own experience and just in that environment, obviously, if you have a company that is more used to dealing with personas and is expecting them and kind of knows what to do with them. I would say for our part, when we actually developed that persona, it was not heavily used or referenced among the different members of the development team, like between product and between 
uh, development. I would say that was, was something that discouraged its usage there. But, it, but again, you know, it's a very organization dependent thing. You know, if the processes are there to support the, the formation of those things. Um, one other thing I would say is that it's kind of dependent on the team as well. Like if there is insufficient bandwidth to actually work on personas and, you know, it's just like other deliverables are being requested and the timeline is very tight. You know, that's another thing that will, will also factor in about whether or not they're used. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. It's an interesting observation because if I actually look at the Jalissa's value proposition canvas, and then I look at the jobs to be done, it seems that there's just something that's connecting the two of them because I'm just looking at the jobs to be done. I'm looking at an article, you know, it's basically saying, identify jobs customers want to accomplish. That's the jobs to be done. Identify the jobs that need to be accomplished. And with Julissa's one, it's a bit like when you look at the gains, you know, it's a bit, it's a little bit connected there, you know, unable to see hardware wallet from one app. So that's what they want. That's the functionality that they want. That's the, you know, um, what is the word I'm looking for? What customers want to accomplish. It's just, it's seeming to be a little bit related. Are you noticing you're nodding as well, Julissa? Yeah, yeah, I I would agree. I think I think that's how the personas help. I guess you you start the personas give you insights into the patterns. I guess that you're seeing. It seems that the the trend here is essentially, if I look at Jonathan's method and Jalissa's method, which is an adaptation of the traditional user persona. It seems as if essentially you're looking for what does the user want the software to do for them. That's basically it. That's what you're really trying to collect that information. What don't they like that the software is doing? What do they like in the most simplistic terms, basically? Um, mm -hmm. And then it's just basically two different frameworks almost that kind of do the same, kind of with the same thing. It's really interesting. Really, really would interesting. You, would you say that um, maybe sometimes the jobs to be done kind of can also signify a, a different user group um, or a different persona, I guess. I guess that's something I kind of see if if I split it between the new Bitcoiners and the 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 longer term Bitcoiners, they have very different jobs to be done. And I, I think there's a lot of data there that I can collect on both sides of those personas, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And Jonathan, just a question. Do you have, you know, when you would be, because you said that also, so there's always the interview process to basically fill in the jobs to be done. Um, how are you guys um, structuring those interview questions? How are you kind of coming up with those? You know, because obviously you're really looking for functionality questions, um, but you don't want to ask that in technical language because, you know, they'd be like, what are you talking about? So how do you do that? For sure, um, there there is you know a structured process, especially at more like mature UX organizations. Like now, being a part of the Home Depot, they have like a whole template for you know starting a research project, and you know usually it begins with a plan. So in the course of this plan, you you identify. And I should I should have brought this up, and that way I could have shared it out. But you identify you know who your users are. Um, the current state of the software, if there is one, you know, what are the business objectives, and then how do those relate? And out of those, you not only get interview questions for the users, but you also get questions that you'll need to take the product, the development, to talk about feasibility. Um, so I would say that, yes, there is, there is a planning process. And when it comes to communicating the technical ideas, I think a lot of times, um, Yes, it's it's kind of like all in the phrasing of the question. And I think, you know, putting the question in terms of um, really, I mean, what I'm what I think of in examples in my head is there's always there's always a like a legacy system or a current state of the software a lot of times in enterprise UX. 
So that is always, you know, something that is very easy to reference. Like, how do you do it now? Is there anything, you know, a certain functionality? Is there anything about it that could be improved or, you know, is a, is a pain point? Um, so using that as a reference, I think is good. I have admittedly very little experience in the consumer end where they might be totally new to the idea of something like Bitcoin. Um, so, you know, I would, I would lean on Jalissa's expertise so I can really um, speak to that use case on the enterprise end. Nice, very nice. Wow, this has been, are there any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, can you remind me again, uh, what kind of resources exist in the Bitcoin design guide related to research? Because we were talking about like new Bitcoiners versus kind of more experienced ones. And I often think about this because you have conversations with people and you're trying to, you know, interpret where they're at in their journey in terms of just understanding things. And, um, but anyways, can you remind me uh, what spot or what page? So that is, a, I love that question because the Bitcoin design guide, so we do have a research section. I will just look for it um, one moment. So we do have a research section because there's definitely been research that has been conducted already um, by two different Patricias. So I will just add in that search query here. Okay, I think there's pretty much an entire section um, for actual research. There's research articles, and then there's actual research that has been specifically conducted, Bitcoin-related research. Um, at the moment, I'm doing research myself within the Bitcoin design community, um, and I will be researching um, Lightning wallets um, and basically conducting an entire research process from beginning to end. Um, so, you know, I just, yeah, that's going to be just built upon. So UX research is definitely something that we're definitely focusing more on. Um, and it's really nice to see you guys jump on this call because it means that you guys value UX research, you know, as much as the community does. So that's really amazing to see. Um, and also the willingness to share your expertise. I mean, I'm, I'm really grateful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it was interesting being on another call uh, one time where they were talking about all the technical aspects of it. And it just made me think about like kind of how the user got forgotten a little bit, you know, where it's, uh, you know, they, they're trying to get something done. Yep. And we're so, a lot of some of these conversations are just so focused on the technical aspect. It kind of leaves out the simplistic yeah. end goal that the user has. And um, it would be great to kind of think through those things. So just make it really easy for the people that are kind of, knee deep yeah. in the technical side of it, you kind of bring it back to reality in terms of like, most people, this is like a foreign language. I mean, honestly, like, you know, you sometimes you listen to a podcast and you're like, this is a completely different language. Like most people have no idea what these terms are. Um, so anyways, that's just something I'm thinking about as I kind of navigate my way through some of this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Get close to the users. That is what we need to do, you know, bring the product development process as close to the users as possible really important really really important yeah i love it that you're also passionate about that uh, rick i am as well julius is nodding her head because she's like yeah me too <laughs> yeah i think we're pretty much done we're just four minutes from the hour um is there anything that anyone would like to add um the only i think the only thing that i would add i think what i've seen using personas um, yeah, over the period that I've been in product, I've found them quite helpful in stakeholder conversations. So when you're when you're seeing, like maybe there's an opportunity, um, I guess founders see and uh, marketers and other team members seem to respond really well to persona data. Yeah, because um, that's yeah. like this is this is the human that's using your software. Here they are, you know that's who you need to pay yeah to. yeah that's that yeah know. yeah absolutely i think a lot of them maybe aren't managed as, as well as they should be but uh i definitely do see that if you're working in a team and there's you have a lot of stakeholders to manage that they can influence or help you at least 
yeah. you know, push in a direction or over pro- with product and whatnot. A question from my side, um, you know, just for the future of these, these um, Jacob would like to speak. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. I, I, I... No, just for the future of these, um, you know, UX research calls, which I'd love to have more of. Are there any other areas of UX research that people are interested in talking about? I'd just be curious to know. Definitely collection. Okay. Um, so was it the data gathering, gathering data? And then analyzing, I think, this is also, you know, affinity maps and different kind of, some people do it in like Excel. Um, mm-hmm. I still like the, don't know, like I still don't have like my own way, the best way to do this. So I think this one be useful. Anything from you? Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think anything specific. And Kate, you've been a little bit quiet. Are you okay to speak? Is there anything that you'd like to learn more about? Testing based off data collected, maybe. Okay. Testing based off data collected. Could you elaborate on that, um, Julissa? I guess, like, I guess one of the things that I'm struggling with is I'm collecting all of this data, I'm getting all this, uh, I'm seeing all these opportunities come through the user interviews and whatnot. But then how do I actually go about, I guess, finding uh, like a, a test um, that's not going to, I guess, cost the business too much, not going to cost too much team resources that could either validate and disprove or, uh, or prove, I guess, a hypothesis that I've made from the data that I've collected. Got you. Yeah, you know, one thing I just thought of was, uh, you know, Jalissa had Maze on there as one of the tools that she uses. And it, it might be interesting to explore using Maze with some of the, uh, the, you know, the prototypes that have been built for the design guy in terms of like, you know, that's one thing that seems like Maze is pretty well. Like, do people get it at all? Like, you know, there's certain things that you need to get done with an app. And do they understand it at all enough to just get that task done? Um, because, you know, a lot of this stuff is new. And uh, even just accomplishing that baseline understanding would be a positive and knowing if it, what percentage of people, I don't know if we would have enough users to really get uh, reliable data on that, but um, anyway, I just had a thought. Yeah. So basically exploring some of the prototypes and then using Maze to do that. All right. I have one more question for Jalisa. Uh, so you, you said you try to interview at least two users per week and my question is like, do you have some kind of like research sprints and does it last like a week or two weeks or how do you structure the whole, you know, organizing, ah. uh, organizing the whole research, you know, re- recruiting participants and then um, how, how does it, uh, how does it look time-wise f- for you? So I guess from the out onset, like I have, wanted to communicate or have conversations with uh, Amber customers just from a more general, I guess, just gathering information, trying to understand, I guess, Bitcoiners or people, the customers using the Amber app, why, their motivations, how they came, came across it, what what they're using, how they're using the app. Um, yeah, some more general questions around that. And then and then I guess with, with the business outcomes that we work towards or the projects that we've been working on, uh, Lightning, the on-chain sends, um, receiving Bitcoin, I will I will create a strategy. Uh, Dovetail has a, a bit of a format that I use there. And basically I go about kind of, I guess, giving that context, trying to understand what are the questions that I want to get answered? What are the larger assumptions that I have? And in tailoring the questions specific to to the project that I'm working on, I'll I'll lean on the team or I'll I'll like 
reach out to my mentors to see kind of what questions I should be considering uh, in, in the interview process. And I guess, um, yeah, so I have a good idea of kind of the questions that I want to cover, uh, the specific questions that I, I absolutely need answered. And, and then with that, I'll just go about working with uh, our, working with the team to, what I do is I release like an intercom outbound where I request for these interviews. So in this case, like this one was related to, uh, I was getting feedback on the, the Bitcoin send feature that we'd launch. Um, so I'll re release this intercom outbound. Generally, I've seen that I can kind of get about two interviews per 100 customers that I, I message. So that's kind of helpful. And yeah, I use Calendly to, to get them booked in. So you tap, tap this link, tap the button here, and then, uh, and then I'd have people directly booked into my calendar link. So it's quite, it's, I found it super easy. It's really easy for me to kind of gather the research, get access to customers as quick as possible. I'm still wanting to reduce that time frame of like wanting the feed, wanting the wanting the answers, I guess, uh, closing that gap. Um, that's where I 